So I wanted to focus on kind of government support for COVID medicines. And I think one thing that's important to highlight is that the funding, there's, there's multiple forms of support. There's the funding itself, and then there's also the intellectual contributions of federal scientists um, who are often driving a lot of this work. Um, and so I wanted to take a deep dive into vaccines in particular. Um, this is sort of the challenge. Um, we will need more that vaccines than we've ever needed before in a very quick amount of time, um, potentially up to 14 billion doses. Um, we, you know, we made a lot of progress. Several have entered late stage clinical trials. Um, and unfortunately, it's still not clear um, whether corporations will be willing to share their knowledge, their know-how to expand supply uh, even as we know that that is crucial to help um, vaccinating the world quickly, as quickly as possible. Um, and so what's interesting about all this is that, you know, there's a clear moral imperative of getting a vaccine to everyone uh, when it's proven safe and effective to everyone as quickly as possible, is the fact that there is an enormous amount of government support that underpins most, um, if not all, of the leading candidates and, and a lot of the work that is going on. Um, and so we have developed, uh, and this is just focused on one U.S. government agency uh, called the Biomedical, uh, U.S. Biomedical Authority on Research, Bar Biomedical Authority Research Development, U.S. Biomedical Research and Development Authority, um, BARDA. Um, and so BARDA has been leading most of the work, uh, but not all of the work, and it's also part of Operation Warp Speed. Um, and so we've been tracking a little bit, uh, you know, where BARDA's investments are going and, you know, what they're funding. Um, and it includes things like both research, development, manufacturing, as well as procurement. Um, and so the numbers are quite staggering. Um, the U.S. government alone has spent around $13 billion. It's a little bit hard to disaggregate um, exactly, uh, you know, what is going for research and development versus manufacturing versus procurement, because sometimes the press releases sort of combine all the information. Um, one of the interesting things you'll note in this summary is that, you know, vaccines are getting a disproportionate amount of the attention of the U.S. government. You can see, you know, 83% of BARDA money is going towards vaccines um, and therapeutics, including some of the therapeutics that President Trump is currently on, including Regeneron's uh, MAP, uh, monoclonal antibody, is getting uh, significantly less amount of attention. Um, and so if you, if you check out citizen.org, you can, you can kind of Play around, play around with the funding summary and tracker, and kind of uh, figure out, you know, who's getting what. Um, so, but, but but one thing I, I really want to focus on uh, is that it's not just the funding. You know, funding is obviously a critical component of it um, in terms of uh, what the federal government is doing to support many of the leading candidates. But sometimes it's also the the intellectual contributions. And so here is something that I came across uh, a few months ago now when I was just reading an article on um, the so-called Moderna vaccine, mRNA-1273. This, of course, is one of the vaccines that's furthest along in clinical development. It's in phase three right now. Uh, it uses a new technology that Luis mentioned called uh, uh, the mRNA platform. Um, and so in that article, I think this was a results from a phase one, perhaps. Um, and this speaks to the, to the lack of transparency in, in the entire system here is that in the scientific article, they had a section called competing in interests. And in that competing interest, which is like a conflict of interest disclosure, in that conflict of interest disclosure section, the US government scientists uh, had to disclose the patent applications uh, that they were inventors of. Um, and so you see two patent applications here. One is the pre-fusion coronavirus spike protein, and then one just is entitled 2019 NCOV vaccine. So one point worth making here is that, you know, why is this information so hard to find? You know, why, why like, do I have to stumble across it, you know, in some random scientific paper? And why is the U.S. government not kind of publicizing it more and talking about it? Um, so that's kind of one, you know, uh, issue with transparency. The second issue, of course, is that based on those two applications, um, and some other documents that Axios obtained, you know, we concluded that basically the NIH uh, is claiming joint ownership of the Moderna coronavirus vaccine, of Moderna's uh, coronavirus vaccine, quote, end quote. 
Um, and the, the reason this is important and kind of the role of the US government here, I think is worth clarifying because it's, um, it, it just helps show the, what public funded science can do. So this is, you know, the third coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the third coronavirus that has really caused major concern in the world. The first two were SARS uh, uh, back in 2003 and then MERS around 2012, 2013. Um, and US government scientists uh, basically uh, for the past few years have been looking into coronaviruses very, with, a, with a particular eye on MERS um, and SARS. And what they were looking at was how do we design um, how do we des design responses to coronaviruses and one real and, and how do we kind of analyze the specific uh, coronavirus itself? So a, a coronavirus is called a coronavirus because if you look at it in a microscope, uh, corona comes from crown. So it looks like a virus with you know wearing little crowns. Um, and the crown, uh, each of the kind of spike uh, is, is, is basically referring to what's called a spike protein. And so scientists have long hypothesized that the spike protein is the best kind of, uh, is the best antigen uh, you can use because that, you know, you want to introduce something that's uh, uh, similar to the spike protein because the this, uh, spike protein is very distinct to the coronavirus and scientists hypothesize that it will generate the best immune response. But the problem with the spike protein is that it's extremely reactive. Um, and you know it changes shapes, and it's like a huge shape shifter, and it all goes all through all these different kind of biological processes. But the U.S. government-funded scientists, uh, including some scientists actually at the NIH and others at the University of Texas Austin, figured out a way how to stabilize uh, the spike protein. And by stabilizing it, by keeping it in that one specific kind of formation, they made some specific uh, amino acid substitutions. By, by stabilizing it. Um, they were able to generate a better kind of immunological response uh, for their MERS, uh, uh, for the MERS work they were doing. And so when this new coronavirus came around, they sort of had, you know, this blueprint ready. They were able to rapidly de deploy this technology. And this is part of the story of why the NIH slash Moderna vaccine was able to be, uh, you know, generated so quickly. Of course, there was actual, you know, Moderna's platform technology that helped as well. But we had this prior knowledge, we had this prior understanding, and so we didn't have to go through trial and error a billion times to figure out what the precise uh, antigen should be. Um, and what's interesting about this is also that, you know, when this first story first came out, Moderna was, you know, its response was basically like, we're not aware of any kind of intellectual property that could prevent us from commercializing our product, which didn't really answer the, the question that we had of, of, you know, what does it mean? Um, and then we were digging through the SEC filings uh, of Moderna and recently the, the, the company has basically said we are not sure whether we were the first to file for the invention of mRNA-1273. Um, and that's a pretty, that's a pretty <laughs> remarkable statement um, that Moderna is essentially saying that we cannot, you know, that there is a risk that someone else, i.e. the NIH, has a, a, a may eventually critically, you know, uh, own a critical part of the vaccine. And this is important, again, because it goes back to the, the first slide I mentioned about the need to ensure that everyone around the world has a vaccine as quickly as possible. Um, and so if the federal government does have the, indeed have some of these authorities, if it indeed, indeed does have some of these ownership rights, um, of course, it should, you know, not exclusively license the rights to allow others to use them, but it should also do so um, on specific conditions, you know, and this goes back uh, to the, sim it's a very similar idea as the funding argument. If you're giving billions of dollars away to a company, uh, like Moderna has received, I think about 2.5 billion now, uh, up to 10 billion actually, but if, you, if you're giving away billions of dollars to a company, um, you should safeguard that investment, you should attach public interest conditions, you should require something of the corporations um, instead of just kind of giving away the money. And so likewise, um, if you have a technology and if you're allowing other companies or if you're allowing corporations to use that technology, then you should condition that the use of that technology on meeting specific parameters. 
And those parameters should ideally pub protect the public interest. And so we're talking about things like ensuring reasonable pricing, sufficient supply. We're talking about things like participating in the World Health Organization's uh, COVID-19 technology access pool. Uh, so to require the corporations who are benefiting not just from public funding, but from public science um, to share their technology uh, to uh, help scale up production. And so we can prevent uh, treatment and vaccine rationing uh, to the extent possible. Um, and I, and I, I, I conclude by saying that, um, and this is an excerpt from an older report, but I think what's, you know, we've kind of dug deep into the Moderna story. And I think, you know, Louise has talked about it and Catherine is gonna talk about it. But while Moderna is unique in some ways, it's actually, Part of a much broader pattern um, in which public funding has underpinned a lot of the development of these new platform technologies that are being used to develop COVID-19 vaccines. And so there's taxpayer support really at many significant points in the development of this vaccine. Um, and it's so critical that that funding is both made transparent and so you don't need, you shouldn't need nerds like me and Louise and Jamie and Catherine to kind of, you know, figure out exactly how much the U.S. government is doing. It should be publicly available. It should be, you know, common knowledge. Um, and so, so it should make it transparent and also it should attach conditions to protect the public interest. Uh, thank you.